Aaron, you you mentioned the dead hang, which I I love that. Uh, what are some other either movements or isometric positions that you love? What are, what are some staple movements or positions that you love to put the body in, and why? Well, I, I mean, be defining movement. I think from movement from the lens of kind of like we're talking about. I, I think that coming into um, breathing would be a form of of movement, you know, and so starting to pay attention to the way that you, way that you breathe. So two things, one from like a weightlifting perspective, starting to understand, um, your ability to create intra-abdominal pressure, bracing your spine naturally when you're picking up heavy stuff off of the ground, or even if you're doing a push up, or if you're throwing a punch or throwing a kick, you know, to be able to access Dr. Stuart McGill calls it the double pulse where if you're throwing a punch or a throw a kick, you first are going to stabilize through your midline. You're going to get really tight like a stone for a second to create leverage. And then your appendage turns into a whip, comes out, and then turns a stone again upon impact and then release. And you go through that cycle. In order to do that, you need to be able to move your torso into a strong, stable, well-oriented position to create leverage for the rest of the body. Um, you know, so a great starting point for that would be uh, just paying attention to, to breathing through the nose. If you're breathing through the nose throughout the day, and I, we can talk about like specific like exercise things as well. Um, but I, when I hear like movement, you know, my mind typically goes in other directions. Um, but just paying attention to the value in getting air through the nose because lots of reasons. Um, one, it slows down the amount of air that you can take in. So you're going to take in about a third of the amount of air. So you, every time you're taking a breath with your nose, you're going to be engaging those diaphragmatic muscles. You know, and so when you're breathing as well, a movement to pay attention to is bringing your hands down the side of the ribs uh, and breathing horizontally, you could call it, or breathing outward, uh, bringing that breath into the low back. So bring your hands into your low back and pay attention to just, can you create that pressure? Can you create a little engagement or like almost like a pushing sensation in your low back? And if you can do that just when you're hanging out, then that sets you up to be able to do a deadlift or do a squat or do a push up or do anything meaningful with your body where you're creating leverage. You know, so what's like a move that I would, I would do, I would say, start paying attention to that pretty much all the time. Um, what's a, a tip that could start to help people to be able to engage that and understand like what that is, as opposed to like, just like a theoretical concept, you get a weight belt. The value of a, a, a weight belt isn't because it just stabilizes your spine. It's because it teaches your body how to create that intra-abdominal pressure and actually have a feedback me mechanism to be able to push against the belt. So you create your own stabilization. You know, so I think a kind of like a static type movement or like, a, like a one thing that I think would be really helpful for a lot of people is invest in, in a little weight belt and you just get like a Velcro one, just kind of push it so you get pressure around your midsection and start tinkering with creating that outward pressure while you are in the gym doing, you know, you could try it with a push up, try it with a squat, try it with a lunge, try it with a military press. You know, most of these movements that we're doing, if we're not stabilizing through the midsection, um, you know, Pavel Tsatsulin, uh, I think it's his analogy where he talks about it's like shooting a cannon out of a canoe. If you're shooting a cannon out of a canoe, you wreck your canoe. <laughs> like if you want a big old cannon, you need to first stabilize your midsection or your, or your canoe. You know, so that would be something that I would think as far as, you know, I don't know, like in dumbbell curls or something like I, I, I think that, that getting into the root of how do we do all of the movements, understanding how to engage with our breath efficiently is going to be ground zero. Yeah. You know, Aaron, um, oftentimes when we lose the ability to do something, I guess, properly or in an optimal way, it's because we've learned to do that thing in a different way that's more optimal based off of what we're asking our body to do. For example, if I walk in high heels all the time, then my body's going to learn how to walk well in, high, in heels, but it's not going to be very good at walking without the heels. And ultimately, walking in heels is a suboptimal way to walk because humans didn't evolve necessarily walking with our heels so elevated. So the, here's the direction I'm going. We're talking about breathing, and I've heard lots of people say, we don't breathe right or we breathe subopt suboptimally like why 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 have we why do we breathe the way that we breathe 
what is that benefiting or why have we learned to breathe in ways that are not optimal for, you know, rib function, oxygen utilization, relaxation, like all the things people say. I mean, it's, there's a lot of other, like there's, there's interesting, there's the, the breathe book by James Nestor. There's shut your mouth, close your, or shut, shut your mouth, save your life. Um, by, uh, who is it? George Catlin, uh, oxygen advantage, Buteco method, be great places to go with this. Um, you know, there's a lot of different mewing, John Mew, like the, like those, anything in, in the, in the realm of, of, um, what is it called? Functional. I forget the other term for it, but all of those directions would be, you know, this would be great channels to go down with that. I think it can start from being a baby, you know, maybe you had like a, 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 like a tongue tie would be one potential thing. And then as a child, you weren't able to naturally have your tongue rest up on the roof of the mouth. Um, and so then you're going to naturally be breathing through your mouth likely throughout the day. Like right now, people listening, if you just bring your tongue up to the roof of your mouth, then you're not going to breathe through your mouth. Like I just did that right now while you're saying that. That's yeah. such a simple, great tip right there. Like yeah. As you were talking, I did that. <laughs> and then it just, it forces you to go right to your nose instead of your uh, breathing. Is that part of the mewing method where it's like that also is, it's affected yeah. orthodontics? Exactly. Yeah. So your tongue acts as a natural retain, retainer for your upper palate or your maxilla. So when you are naturally just breathing like a human, once again, like this is just breathing like a human. This isn't some wild, crazy thing. This is just accessing the 30 odd functions that your nose, your nasal passages have specifically for respiration. And like the one that your mouth does, your mouth just allows you to get a lot of air quick. Like that's the function of your mouth if you if from a breathing perspective. But if you're over breathing, and this kind of gets into like Patrick McEwen and oxygen advantage and Buteco method, uh, if you're over breathing, your cells become less effective at releasing uh, oxygen. So your red blood cells, um, they end up, they have a higher, it's called oxygen binding affinity uh, when you have a lot of air. And so when you're breathing all the time, your cells essentially become lazy because they think that your body has access to all the air in the world. When you reduce the amount of air that your body has access to by no nasal breathing would be one thing, just slowing down your breath through your nose would be helpful as well. You know, when you're breathing, ideally, I got this from Patrick McEwen as well, who he helped revise the nose breathing chapter and Wim Hof helped with it as well. And, well, Wim Hof didn't really help. He, he read through and like gave me a thumbs up. And, you know, he's like, he's like, I like it. Um, but it, when you're breathing, ideally, it should be so soft and so smooth that you don't even feel the little hairs inside your nose moving. Like they should just be still, you know, and you shouldn't, if someone, if you approach someone and you can hear them heavy breathing, that's an indication that that person is sick or they're winded. If they're winded, that's fine. But if you're at rest, you're like, <sighs> Like that person, you're like, oh my God, like they, they need help. I but hope they, that's maybe not they can my squat parents. like 500 pounds though. You know what I mean? But maybe they can squat. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, exactly. BMI first. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, and so, and then, and then within, within, the, so there's a lot of things. I know that the question was, how does this happen in the first place? There's a lot of potential reasons this happens in the first place. Another, another direction, um, because pre agrarian age and like even into, into researching into like Native Americans and such, um, having malocclusion or crooked teeth was pretty much a, a, like a, a non-event. And the reason for that is, is the, the, the body naturally has this retaining mechanism called your tongue that, that maintains spaciousness in the mouth. And also naturally, you're probably going to be eating rougher foods. So when you're eating rougher foods, you're gnawing through a stick or you're, you know, you're biting on whatever it is you need to bite because you don't have a bunch of really sharp razor blades. So maybe you kind of like are, are using your mouth like a tool, kind of like you use the rest of your body like a tool. Like you pick something up off of the ground, you're essentially outsourcing your muscles to be a tool to pick something about up off of the ground. You know, your masseter muscles and everything, like it's all fair game. You know, and so if you're actively utilizing those muscles, then those muscles respond and you're going to have a stronger jawline and you might have, you're not going to have that like receding chin. Um, I just had Stephen Lynn on my podcast who he's a functional dentist and we got like really deep into 
the value of fat soluble vitamins, which are missing from a lot of modern people's diets, particularly A, D, and K3. And they have this interesting like trilogy where they they um, you know affect with each other. They all pair off with each other to help with your bony development, you know, and development of more things than just bones. You know, and so if you're missing some of those natural foods, such as maybe like organ meats and things of the sort. Uh, where there's, they're very rich in this fat soluble vitamins that also is going to impact your bony development, you know, but the, the big, very clear, like elephant in the room is if you have crooked teeth, you know, or your mouth breathing, you know, or any of, any of that, just look at where is your tongue. And if you want to get stronger and more, you know, efficient with the way that you move that, that tongue engagement of the tongue is actually uh, as well going to be helpful with um, increasing strength as, as well as uh, jaw strength. If you're squeezing down your jaw and there's been research for this in relation to pull-ups, uh, people on average can, can get a couple more pull-ups out. You know, so if you're, when you're doing a pull-up, if you have a mouthpiece or I've seen it done where you have like a little weight around your mouth and it's like hanging down, you're like, oh, you got to hold, hold the weight up. You actually end up. And I think what this would ultimately probably relate to would, would be one, maybe some better orientation of the cervical spine, you know, and like maybe find like neutrality in the spine. But I think a big thing is, is concept that you guys are probably familiar called irradiation, which is like one of like Sheraton's laws. It's, it's essentially when you are contracting that by having a stronger contraction, it allows you the potential to engage more motor units throughout the whole body. So the more of your body that you use, the stronger your body will become. You know, so if you're doing a, a bench press, for example, or a squat, you know, or anything, ideally that bench press movement, which you guys know way more about this, I, I think like these topics than I do, I'm like more of an enthusiast, uh, but the, a strong bench presser is going to be bench pressing with every freaking muscle in their body. It's by no means like a pec major, pec minor, tricep, anterior delt exercise, you know, and if it is that you probably don't have a big bench press. And so incorporated in that would be, you know, look like tongue posture and, and jaw posture and, you know, really your whole body. Yeah, no, this is true. I, uh, uh, I remember reading about uh, Weston A. Price. He was a dentist that traveled the world and he would take pictures of these, you know, what they, what they referred to as primitive people's teeth and yeah. jaws and noticed none of them had dental care, but nobody had cavities. Nobody needed braces. Nobody needed their wisdom teeth pulled out. And they had really big straight teeth and jaws and he all related it to their diet and showed that they yeah. they ate very little grains and lots of animal meats and proteins and tubers and vegetables and um they had f like different shaped faces jaws and their and their teeth were all extremely healthy so yeah, yeah I, i've read a lot about what you're saying and I, I you know it's um it's quite interesting that it worked out that way yeah yeah i mean and, and again once again it like comes back to very simplistic almost like silly concepts, like a lot of the things that make us really healthy. Uh, it's like, oh yeah, you mean that those things that people were like the brutes were doing, you know, the <laughs> people that we, we think are like, oh, like simple minded. It's like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> they were from a, a cellular biological perspective winning. Yeah. The simpletons. That's, that's true. Now, Aaron, 